Hello and welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week we've got safer bikes, faster bikes and another new gravel bike. Oh yes, we're also asking whether it really matters where your bike was made and who made it. Right then, mate, what's hot in tech this week? Well, I think we should start with Priority Bikes, who have a prototype, Safer Cycle, okay? So they were inspired by the good people at Toyota, the car brand, and specifically their Camry model, which is apparently loaded with safety features that makes for a safer driving experience. So yeah, Priority have basically taken inspiration and integrated those design features into a bike, which I think is Pretty cool for a start. Uh, one of those features is a headlight, which automatically adjusts depending on your speed. So I think that's I think that's worthy of a shout out. Uh, you've got uh, blind spot lights to alert drivers, so they can basically know exactly where you are, which I have found myself foul to in the past. Uh, and then don't forget about this: you've got some sensors on there, so that if someone enters your danger zone, whatever that is, uh, actually it comes up on a little display unit on your bike. And importantly. I shouldn't forget, it's got a horn on it as well. Toyota Camry <laughs> horn, I love well, horn. there we go. Now, to be fair, we shouldn't be too dismissive of this. We did say last week that we could perhaps live without a lot of new smart tech, but if the smart tech is gonna try and improve our safety, then we shouldn't dismiss it out of hand, should we? Maybe no. safety tech is yeah, okay. Exactly. And personally, I think that if it's gonna encourage more people to feel safer riding in cities in particular, it can't be a bad thing. Can I jump on my soapbox, just very quickly? Go on then, go okay, on. Okay, because actually I kind of almost think they're tackling the wrong thing here, in that it shouldn't be about making people feel safer on their bikes, it should be about making people safer on their bikes, and actually the bike is the wrong place to do it. Cycling itself is a relatively safe bit, yeah. it's vehicles around us that are what put us at risk, yeah. a lot of the time, anyway. So I kind of don't really want to take away from that issue, and you know maybe it's actually about transport planning at the end of the day. Anyway, I'll jump off my soapbox now. Yeah. What should we talk about now then? Uh, time trial bikes? Yeah, time trial bikes. All right, so check out this new bike from Willia. It's called the Turbine. Now, it's been designed based around four principles, aerodynamics, braking, positioning, and portability. Portability. Portability, but hey, more on that later on. Yeah, all right, let's go with aerodynamics first. Shall we? That's principally the reason you would buy a TT bike, you would have thought. Yeah. And what's really interesting about this is they say they've improved the aerodynamics by using disc brakes, okay? So what they've managed to do is increase the clearance around the wheels, so specifically the fork blades, the fork crown, and the rear triangle, and they've only been able to do that by getting rid of the brake calipers and replacing them with disc brakes instead. Oh, that's cool, isn't it's it? It's a bold shout, yeah, but yeah. I mean, we've seen that on track bikes in the past, haven't we? Yeah, we have, yeah. And all, to be fair, all Bayer's TT bikes are marketed on the fact that they've got those free flow forks, they are, and yeah. they're road frames too, actually. And then sticking with braking, uh, I mean, that is something which on time trial bikes comes under quite a bit of scrutiny, doesn't it? Because well, of... they don't really have any, normally. <laughs> <laughs> and also the routing, though, of the cables is quite often not ideal, is it, really? No. Not for a Bowden cable, so by putting hydraulics on there means whatever the route, you're still going to get good braking. Yeah, it's great. Like and it, to be fair, that's something also that's been done before, isn't it? Cervelo did yeah. that right back in 2011 when they partnered with Magura yeah. for that TT bike. They were cool looking brakes, weren't they? They were very cool, weren't they? Yeah. Uh, and then there's the other thing, the position. So the TT bars have got quite a lot of built-in adjustment on there, which is yeah. pretty good for proprietary bars. And then also the seat post, it's got three positions. So you've got 25 mil of layback, you've got an inline post, which is I guess where most of us would end up with our yeah. position. And then plus 65 millimeters, basically getting you in front of the bottom bracket and allowing triathletes out there to adopt their running position while cycling. That is outrageous, isn't it? 65 mil forward. Yeah. See, the UCI rules are good for some things. Exactly, it stops us <laughs> cycling like triathletes. <laughs> uh, now, finally, onto that portability statement. Uh, basically, the handlebars of this bike are able to be a, essentially, what, shrunk in 40 seconds. So the base bar can basically be folded down so that when you put your bike into a bag for transport, all of your settings remain intact though. So then at the other end, I suppose, you can just simply fold it up, no adjustment, go out and ride your bike. You know what, it sounds like a gimmick, but actually that's the kind of thing that could stop real headaches. And oh, be, massive be headaches, like one of those yeah. things where you, every time you travel, you're like, you know what, I'm, thank my lucky stars that I've got shrinkable handlebars. Yeah. Instead of spending three hours to set up my headset again. There we go, yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, maybe they're yeah. on something. Prices now. start at 7,700 euros. Oh, there we are. Okay, uh, right, moving on, John. 
from TT bikes to gravel bikes. Yes. Not another one. Come on, mate. It's been at least a week. It has since a we week talked to the date. Yeah, yeah, since we last talked about a gravel bike. <laughs> but this this is another cool one, actually. This is from 8Bar, super cool, a Berlin-based brand, and it's the Grunwald. Nice. Now, it does look cool. Uh, it does look quite a bit like the 3T Explorer, to be perfectly honest with it you. It does, doesn't it? Very yeah. like the 3T Explorer. No bad thing, though, because that's a very beautiful bike. Uh, now, 8Bar started actually making fixed gear bikes, mm. presumably, you'd think, with their tyres pumped up to 8Bar, <laughs> which, uh, which obviously no one would do nowadays. No, nobody. Especially not on a gravel bike. They maybe need to call themselves 2Bar for that one. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we're digressing. Basically, they started out with fit gear bikes, and now they have a full, complete range of bikes. Still very trendy, but a complete range. Yeah, a bit too trendy for us. <laughs> anyway, as I already mentioned, it's called the Grunewald, and basically, it's got a more road-orientated or road-style geometry, hasn't it? Um, and basically, on our gravel spectrum, where's it going to sit? Well, more towards the road end exactly. of our gravel more spectrum. The road than however, there is, a, there is a however in there, isn't there? There is indeed, because you can fit 650B tyres in there. Uh, only up to 51 millimetres, though, as opposed to the 55 that can go inside the 3T. Yeah, so that's like a two-inch mountain bike tyre, isn't it? 50 big, mil, isn't it? something like that. It is a big tyre. Yeah. But uh, anyway, it's also got uh, fender mounts, so mud guards, and also rack mounts. Yeah. And... As something that I would have scoffed at three weeks ago, bottle boss mounts on the front fork. But now I've been bikepacking, John. Oh, I'm, well aware. Now, isn't I'm well aware if you want to, want to run a full frame bag, uh, then you're going to need to put your water bottle somewhere else. Either that or have a, a water bladder in your frame bag and a straw. I just stop at the shop. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. how much does it cost? 1,600 euros. Available for pre-order now, well, apparently. That's all right, isn't it? All right. More tech later on, mate. More tech later. Who really made your bike? And does it matter? So a couple of weeks back, I was at the Bespoke Show here in the UK, and I was privileged enough to see some beautiful, unique, and well, fascinating bikes there on display. Yeah, for many people though, those aren't the only three reasons why you would buy a hand-built and custom bike. There's also the fact that many people love to know who made it. So actually mm. talking to the person that makes your bike and seeing them at work. But it did get us thinking, is that important? Should it really matter where your bike was made and who made it? Well, the bike industry is really just like any other major industry out there in that it's truly globalised. So think of it like this. Maybe your bike has been designed in the US, made in China, painted in Taiwan, assembled in Europe and then sold in Australia. It can save you money to manufacture in the Far East because the overheads can be lower. But we've got to say at this point, haven't we as well, that actually much of the global expertise in manufacture, particularly carbon fibre, does now lie in Taiwan and China, doesn't it? That is very true, in fact. Um, and I mean, it might not appear that romantic, for instance, having your frame made in a factory which just specialises in carbon manufacturing, because in there they might always be making tennis rackets or something like that. <laughs> yeah. But there is also the chance that basically it's going to yield in a better quality frame than, say, a bloke just knocking one together in his shed. Yeah, <laughs> that, does, that is a fair point, mate. Now, I think it does feel, doesn't it, like carbon fibre of all the materials, of everything we're talking about, is, is the one thing that people latch onto is, is not having a soul when it's made in a big factory. And I think probably that's because much of it comes out of a mould, which makes people think that, you know, it's like a jelly, isn't it? Just like boop, 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 carbon frames coming out. When in actual fact, the reality is far from that. The carbon needs to be cut and then laid by hand in the mould. Then when the curing process is complete and then needs to be finished by hand, and I'll admit, the first time I saw that process firsthand, I was utterly blown away. I think it was in the, one of the SRAM facilities in Taichung, in Taiwan, and I could not believe how many people, how many pairs of hands were involved in making a pair of SRAM red cranks. It was bonkers. It's pretty, Absolutely it's bonkers. It's quite labour intensive, isn't it? Yeah. Much more. I'm just like you. I thought it'd be like a toaster, just popping out. Yeah, <laughs> there are, another crank, another crank. But no, it's not. It's like not that. like toast. No, <laughs> no, it's really not. <laughs> so I think to answer the original question, we need to separate the industry into two. And first of all, look at the brands who design in-house and then specify the carbon layer, own their own moulds, uh, then possibly have it sent off to a third party to be manufactured under the watchful eye of a quality control manager. Yeah, versus those brands that buy what's called a generic open mould design. So, so those are frames where they're designed and made by a manufacturer specifically with the intention 
of them painting them up and sticking different decals on the down mm. tube. And uh, basically, you just buy them out of a catalogue. And if you buy enough of them, you then can get them painted up as you want. You yeah. could call them John's Horny Bites, if you, you want to. You could do, yeah. In fact, I've already got that. No, uh, <laughs> But I mean, I don't see a problem with either of them. Um, as long as, basically, that second model, which you just spoke about, is not over the top price-wise. And normally, they are significantly cheaper, actually, aren't they? Yeah, John's Horny Bikes would be bargain-based. Very cheap, they? very yeah. cheap and whereas, <laughs> Yeah, whereas the first option, you know, the, perhaps the kind of more conventional big name brands, you know, that feels to me a little bit like like buying an iPhone, okay, bear with me, but does it matter that your iPhone is made in China and assembled from parts that have been sourced across the globe? No. Is it still an Apple product if or when the battery is from Samsung and the camera is from Sony and the screen is from Sharp? No, because I think the important bit is that the operating system, the design and all the thought behind it comes from the brand itself. Yeah. So I think the soul of a bike then is in its design, is that what we're trying to say? I think so. I think that certainly the design process is probably one of the most cost-intensive parts of manufacturing yeah. a bike. And it does feel, doesn't it, like when you match up the brand with the design, that is the soul of the bike. And it also mm. explains why you can get two bikes made in the same factory for different brands, but that are completely distinct, completely separate. They've got their own personalities, their own ride qualities, because you know that seems to be the bit. And, and that's totally cool. It doesn't matter where it's made then, yep. just as long as there's not Massive discrepancy in the price. Four times the cost for exactly yeah. the same. Then I'd have a big, big problem. Yeah, that's why John's horny bikes can be so cheap. <laughs> so I think perhaps this question has arisen, the fault of the bike industry perhaps, dare I say it, uh, for not actually taking pride in manufacturing in locations of expertise. So Taiwan, for instance. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, mate, I just want my bike to be built by an expert in a location of expertise. Yeah, you know what? I think that's absolutely bang on, isn't it? So maybe... The answer to does it matter where your bike is made is actually yes, but not in the way that maybe we thought it was going to be. No. It matters that it's made by experts and then that it's priced accordingly. Yeah. Those two things, when they line up, that's all we ask. Yeah, then we're happy. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's what we think. But what about you guys? Let us know in the comment section. We've said about mainstream manufacturer, but what about custom? If you've bought yeah. a custom bike, why did you buy it? And how much do you love it? Why do you love it? Get involved in the comment yeah. section down below. Yeah, we also obviously asked your opinion last week, didn't we? We did. About or what tech can you live without and what can't you live without? And uh, predictably, perhaps, it went off in the comment section. It was great, wasn't it? Yeah, first up, uh, Bear Marshall King. Uh, I don't know if this is another, I don't know if this is a pseudonym for Cy. Uh, he can definitely live without the front derailleur. Uh, basically, dislike everything that requires maintenance or adjustment. So, so riding a fixie then, I guess? Yeah, basically, that's that's the way forward for Bear Marshall King. Fair enough. Uh, William, uh, William Direction. I can't live without my puncture money tire lever kit. I had it for 30 years, it goes on every ride. I just add new patches and glue every now and then. That's pretty cool, very low-fi yes. solution, but I like it. Yeah, there's no smart tech in there, is there? Nope. Uh, Liam Sangaku, uh, tech I can live without, gravel bike. Let's be honest, nobody needs them. Use a cyclocross bike or a road bike with wide tires. Yes, Liam. No. Liam, no. Like, what right. you, what's, well, who's right. to say a cyclocross bike is the right bike for a job just because it already exists? Just saying it to disagree with you. Yeah, That's no, what? I just, you know, like, fair enough, you can get annoyed with people trying to flog you the same bike but yeah. call something different. But actually, there's no reason that an old school cyclocross bike is actually the best bike for riding off road on. Far from it. Oh, fact. yeah, yeah. Some oh, of them totally. Are, yeah. some, some, of them are, some of them are awful. Total rubbish, yeah, basically. <laughs> anyway, there we go. There's a debate for another day. Yeah. Uh, what about Stephen Moore? STI shifters can go back to down tube levers. No, that's true. Yeah. That is I, very do true. You know, I remember the first time I went to STI levers and I went out for a ride and I reached down for a, a gear lever. This hand, well, I nearly lost it in the front wheel. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I couldn't imagine it, actually. You know. uh, lastly, Big Foz. Mini pumps. Someone recommend me one that will work more than three times before it goes in the bin. He's back to frame pumps. ZFAL one, about 25 year old, plastic, faded and ratty. There we are, frame pumps. Well, yeah, a lot of people are uh, big advocates of frame pumps. I've got to say though, people. just because it's a big pump doesn't mean it's going to last. Because actually, the, the important bit, like the bit that fits on the valve, is yeah. going to be the same whether it's a mini pump or a frame pump, surely. That is true. Although, I've had problems with frame pumps in the past. You know, the basically the steel rod, I don't know, the piston or whatever, snapping in the middle of the winter, yeah. you know, and you're 
you're a bit angry, aren't you? Because you've, you've got a puncture, <laughs> and you there you are frantically pumping away, and then suddenly it just gets twisted and bent, and then you're left without it. So yeah. I'd rather have a mini pump. You know, that's the problem with CO2 cartridges, isn't it? You can't get your anger out, can it? Yeah. Oh, exactly. Damn it. No aggression there at all. Yeah. Anyway. I, to be fair, I noticed actually <laughs> under Big Foss, he says, I need it to pump up to 120 psi in under a week. Tell you what, Big Foss, don't put 120 psi in your tyres. <laughs> two you bar. Get, yeah, exactly. <laughs> two bar is all you need. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much as ever for getting involved in the comment section. We love it. We do love it. And uh, yeah, we can't wait to see what you say about this week as well. Oh, hot. Right then, let's have some more new tech, John. Yeah, so Si, good news mate, I'm back stalking pro cyclists, <laughs> getting out the magnifying glass and looking at race photos. Good news for us lot, less good for the pros. <laughs> exactly, I am banned from every Grand Tour. Uh, joking aside, it looks like there's a new helmet on its way from French brand Ecoy, because I spotted Romain Bardet of Azur des Le Mondial wearing a new helmet. Looks pretty nice there. It does look cool, doesn't it? Now we did have a look on the Ecoy website, no info on there as yet. <laughs> It's got to be said, it does remind me quite a lot of that sort of hairnet helmet that you were wearing just last week on the show. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, is it? They look like <laughs> such a plonker. Well, Go unfortunately on. it doesn't look too like that helmet. So uh, anyway, I think retro cool, that's a good thing. Yeah. Now sticking with cool, last week uh, Kanye West put up a picture on, I think it was Twitter, wasn't it? of basically he's got himself a high road cycling jacket and he was bigging it up, you know. Who knew that cool. those high road jackets were cool? Exactly. But there we go, Kanye said it was. And then this week, seen a picture from Pharrell Williams of him wearing, check out these Oakleys, mate. Oh, yes. Oakley blades. How cool are what they? Was that, 91? Yeah, I mean, they're pre-mumbos, aren't they? So they are ultra Pre cool. Pre-mumbos. Now, I don't, mumbo number five, no. <laughs> now, I don't know if they're diamond encrusted or if it's just glittery paintwork. Either way, he's a lucky lad, isn't he, to get, him, get his ears, basically, on a set of those. Yeah. I don't know if he rides a bike, though. Imagine if Pharrell turned up in your club run in yeah. diamond encrusted Oakleys, if that he, would be a great day. If he does, let us know, and I promise you now, GCN Tech will show up on your group ride, and maybe Sai si will give a rap for him or something like that. I'll rap with Pharrell. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine how embarrassing that would be? Oh, Pharrell, yeah. yes, uh, I like to do a bit of rapping in my space. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> to the extreme, write the mic like a vandal, get up on stage and wax the junk like a candle, dance. That's all I got. Uh, right, anyway, what's next? Oh yeah, on the GCN show uh, this week, we uh, delved into the murky world of Kickstarter. Now, oh. who doesn't love a little bit of Kickstarter? Basically, completely unfiltered ideas. Some of them amazing, some of them utter sh**. Uh, but one of the ones that we missed, actually, was a German brand called Urban, and uh, they have crowdfunding for their new Urban bikes. And it's got to be said, they look amazing. They Never do. did I think that a bike needed to be without a seat tube, but take it away, and that is a thing of beauty. That is stunning. 11 speed hub gears, belt drive, Conti tyres, dynamo lights, integrated lighting. You can even put on uh, mug guards too, which in <laughs> my opinion is absolutely essential for urban riding. Yeah, that is true. Although I think there's a slight irony in getting rid of your seat tube only to replace it with a mud guard. That is true, but sometimes mud guards can be an absolute pain to fit. That's Either true. way, it looks great, and I actually hope they smash their funding target. Yeah, 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 that's great. Definitely uh, in agreement there. Uh, right now, before we finish with new tech this week, what about this that has popped onto our radar? It's tiny bike tech. <laughs> yeah. This is genuinely microscopic bike tech. There's a chap in Japan that is 3D printing miniaturized components and frames and indeed complete bikes. Yep. Customizable, choose the one that you want from your favorite team. You could even have your own mini bike version of your, your of own. Of your own, yeah. Full Water time bottles, bike. the lot. I mean, the cranks apparently, they come out in two pieces as well, so you've got to put them together, put chain rings onto it. And the fact that your cables have been replaced by fishing wire. That is a person who has got too much time on their hands. Well, I don't know, John, but I quite want one. I want one as well. Because I never really got into the whole making aeroplanes thing when no, I was a kid. I got bored doing that. But you, if I someone had said, it is a, you know, here's a miniature Canyon Air Road, I'd be like, oh, go on then. Yeah, can I have DI2? <laughs> Imagine that. Anyway, more tech next week. It's time now for the GCN Tech Wall of Fame. Last week, we inducted John's old hairnet helmet into the Wall of Fame, but deservedly so. This week is something altogether classier. Sorry, John. It's the Vitus 979. Yeah, an absolutely stunning bit of kit, this. Um, so, essentially, it was a bonded aluminium frame. Uh, now, they were initially first seen in 1979, but they weren't used 
well, really in popularity up until the mid 80s. So I'm not sure what was going on in that little time gap there. Uh, however, what was so special about them? Like I just said, they were bonded, but they were interference fit as well. So what? Sorry, mate. What's interference fit? Well, basically, there was cast alloy lugs. Yeah. And the tubes were actually well covered in resin first of all, and then essentially hit into place, and that's what held them there. My God. Yeah, a little bit scary. Um, but those telltale alloy lugs, you know, that certainly stood out. And I just remember as a child just looking at them and just being in lust because they were absolutely incredible. Now, the seat post initially was held in place, get this, with a little grub screw through the back that basically screwed almost into the seat post. So um, no clamp or anything like that. It was just through sheer force, I Crikey. guess, M10 thread. Um, interestingly as well, the tubes were anodized as well, and that's what really made them stand out a lot. So if there's you get like the five impression or six John likes colorways, the yeah. Vitus 979, then, uh, then you it. would be correct. I really want one. <laughs> right, now in the mid 80s, it was more widely adopted by the Pro Peloton. And you can see why, because it was an awful lot lighter than steel, wasn't it? Uh, in fact, so popular was it that many pros who were not sponsored by Vitus went out and bought Vituses and then resprayed them on you just unfortunately couldn't hide the aluminium lugs, could you? No. But uh, anyway, John would spot them a yeah. mile off with a magnifying glass. <laughs> and one of the reasons they did it actually was because the uh, geometry on it was more aggressive than like, a lot of the Italian frames from back then as well. So Vitus, a French company, they sort of took the initiative there. Now, a couple of downsides were the frames were very, very flexible. Uh, I remember riding on my dad's one and thinking, what on earth was this? It Serious? Was, yeah, yeah, it wasn't the stiffest bike ever. And also, they became unstuck, literally. That's quite a downfall. Yeah, because that resin kind of just gave way. A friend of mine actually has got a couple of packs of the old resin repair kits. Well, I wouldn't use that. If it didn't work in the first place, I definitely don't think it'd be worth <sighs> yeah, putting it It was down. cool, mate. Look, no. it was good enough for Sean Kelly. Well, he won go. a lot of races on one of those, so... He did, he did. Yeah, and Sean Kelly makes everything cool. Yeah, That's fair does. enough. Toe clips. Yeah. Right, there we go. The Vices 979 going in at the GCN Tech Wall of Fame. Make sure you get involved and let us know what you would like to see inducted into the Wall of mm. Fame next week. All right, bike of the week time. Oh. And first up, we need to announce the results of last week's where we put head to head two bikes from the Bespoke Bike Show. They were pretty, pretty nice, weren't they? They were. And the winner, with 76% of the votes, was Dan Craven's Saffron Framework. Oh, bike. There, there you are, go. your mate managed to win. There we go. Let's just insert a little picture of Dan dancing, shall we now? Yeah, he's having dance. Yeah, there we go. There he is, doing his dad dance. Right, <laughs> this week's poll, we're going to put two of the fastest race bikes mm. going, okay? In fact, the first one, the Bianchi Ultra XR4 of Primoz Roglic, is literally one of the fastest bikes of the Pro Peloton this year. Yeah. He is absolutely flying. And it's a stunner, isn't it? We've got a Shimano Dura Race group set on there. We've got deep section C60 wheels, Shimano power meter as well. And, ah, oh, that paint job that you absolutely adore, John. Anyway, it's going up against the Ridley Helium SL of Jens Kukulaire. So this is the Belgian brand Ridley. They've got an Italian Campagnolo Super Record group set, SRM power meter, Bora wheels. I'm torn, mate. I genuinely don't know which I'm one not. to vote. I'm, I'm not. Which one are you voting for, John? I'm going to vote for that Ridley, mate. Are you? Yeah. Nice, nice simple paintwork. Nothing to uh, distract the eye or anything like that. To be yeah. fair, go on then. I'm going to go for the Bianchi. I love that bike. It's absolutely anyway, badass. It's not about us. You've got to vote up there. And next week, we'll reveal we have two more head to head. Right, it's time for the bike vault. And well, there's been a bit of controversy in the comments, hasn't there, about yes. that bell. People don't seem to like it. So. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Most people love this bell. One or two, unfortunately, didn't like Con it. Con Jennings, so he didn't like it. Let's put it in contrast against that thing, which. Don't press it, mate, whatever you do. All right. um, so anyway, let's just say it's it's the lesser of two evils. So okay. uh, yeah, anyway, this is my one of my favorite parts of the show. Let's crack in, let's see some amazing bikes. Yeah, well, let's start up then. First off with Adam Stevens from Surrey in the UK. This is his Gosforth stainless steel bike. Ooh. And I've got to say, that's a beauty, isn't it? That is a beauty. It's got, what's he got on here? He's got old Tegra. Uh, he's got a nice gold chain. I do like a gold chain. He understands you don't like gold chains, though. Well, I mean, that's not matches, too gold. Look, it matches the headset, it matches the top cap, it matches the hub, presumably the rear hub, too. He's got his valves lined up. He, a lot of attention to detail there. It is great. The only thing, John, 
it's just the background's not that great, yeah. is it? And you know, is, I, that, is that a mirror? I don't know what it is. No. I do like his bottle cages. Those are pretty cool, aren't they? Yeah. Ah, oh, mate, I'm torn. Grey I mean, bar, is... bar tape, though. I think that's... It was probably white once. Yeah. No, I, I love that bike, but there's something about this that's just not screaming super nice. No. Neither for me. Which it's, is which is brutal because it is. it is an absolute stunner. Yeah, it's, it's a, a nice, nice bike. bike. It's a nice bike. It's, it's a nice. A nice bike. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, but the bell is remaining unrung. Right. Ooh. Gregor uh, Pasirin, Pasirin from Slovenia. It, Check out that backdrop. Y yeah, snowy. A new S Works SL6 by uh, the look of yeah, it. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, he's got S Works cranks. Well, the quark power meter on there as well. Yeah, is that Durace Di2? I think I think it is. Uh, yeah, Roval wheels, yeah. valves lined up, cranks at three o'clock. That is good, and there's something about the snowbank that I like. Even a saddlebag looks good on that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't think saddlebags necessarily look bad, but it looks good on that bike. But what are we going to say, mate? What are you thinking? Well, the snow apparently was between three and four metres deep there. All right, it's a yeah. super nice. Super nice. That was the only thing missing was some form of info <laughs> of, about of, the of backdrop. Like craziness of yeah. what he's had to do. Right, uh, Jasper from Belgium. This is his first real road bike. Now, wow, first up, Jasper. that is not Belgium as we know it, is it? No, that looks like Dubai. <laughs> yeah, that certainly does not look like Belgium. It could be though. It could be Ostende or Depana. Who knows? I love but, that shot though. That's yeah. a great shot, and the bike is a yeah. perler, isn't it? Yeah, and like just the the decals and the bottle, the way that they just pop out from the image. I like it. Yeah, cheeky little sunset in the background. Yeah, a couple of people sat down there as well enjoying the sunset too. All, all I'd say Photo is bombing. stick those cranks at three o'clock and it's perfect. But yeah. do you know what? I'm tempted to say that's a super nice. Yeah, I, I think it's super nice that, as well. That image sings to me. Yeah. Lovely bike, lovely location. Yeah, spot Ready? on. Go on. Super nice. Nice one, Jasper. Right, Matthew Langston of wow. Iowa. Uh, and this is at the Grand Canyon. That's his Massey. Two riders at the Grand yeah. Canyon. Look Check at that. Out that view. Whoa. Fair play. Oh. That looks like an amazing place yeah. to stop mid ride. Yeah. That is a perler. And the bike is a lovely bike as yeah. well. Look nice at looking that. bike, that. Yeah. What have we got on there, John? I can't uh, see it. We've got FSA chain set. It looks like 105 shifters and mechs. Uh, some Conti tyres. Yeah, Camelback bottle. It's one. Of, that's one of those bottles. I think keeps you, like one of the ice cold ones as well. Yeah, it's gonna yeah. get hot out there, isn't it, Grand Canyon? Yeah. D do you know what? I, I love the I love the backdrop. I love the bike, but there's something about it. It's not not quite working for me. I mean, the bike. It's not even in the big ring. That's what it is. Can you? Can, do you mind going back up to the Grand Canyon and just doing that all over again? But maybe put the bike in the big ring. And get rid of that tree on the left. So yeah, and also and the, the shadow on the right. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the steerer tube probably needs to be cut down before it gets We're not super being nice. too fussy, are we? No, no, but, you no know, I think, Matthew, you know, to be fair... Everyone's you know, got to aim. It's all about exactly. goals, isn't yeah, it? You it's know? all about super nice. And if, Matthew, you get to go back to the Grand Canyon to take your photo again, you're not going to complain. Yeah, blame you? it on us. Yeah, anyway, that is a nice yeah, nice bike. Nice looking bike, Matthew. Very nice bike. Right, finally, wow. Rhys Edwards of Edinburgh Road Club up there in Scotland. Uh, apparently he's training for a Paris-Roubaix ride uh, wow, in late cool. May. So he's been taken to the cobbles there in Edinburgh. There is a lot of cobbles in Edinburgh, isn't there? There are, yeah. So let me get straight. That's a cyclocross bike yeah. by the look of the Canties with one by, yeah. but a Shimano one by. So yeah. he's got a... It's like a front neck hack thing, isn't it? Yeah. Like guide thingy. Great vintage of, uh, of cranks there. Yeah. I like that a lot, John. Yeah. I really, really like that. that Gun wall tires. Very cool. Yeah, and he's risked it, hasn't he? You know, that that is a road, and he's just put his bike there, taking a picture, stick as well. Zip, zip 303 Firecrest. That's a rude bit of kit, Ooh, isn't it? Reese is a lucky lad, isn't he? He is, isn't he? Do you know what, John? Yeah, go on, ring it. That's a super nice super from nice. me. Super nice. Best of luck in your Pony Bay ride. Yeah, all the best for that. Now, remember as well to submit your photos for the Bike Vault using the email address on screen right now and include a little bit about the bike, maybe the location too, because we want to give you a big old shout out. We're getting towards the end of the show now, but John, what is coming up on the channel this week? Well, on Saturday, I get to check out the bike of TJ Van Garderen, a very nice BMC oh, indeed. Oh, I do like that. And then on Sunday, we get to watch you look at titanium and what's so special about it in seven things you should know about titanium. That's right, finally completing the material sciences course it is with titanium. Uh, then Monday, John, you hit the workshop, don't you? Because yeah. it is maintenance mistakes that we all make. Mm. Yeah. 
how many times you lost the skin off of your knuckles. Uh, and then, of course, Wednesday is the GCN Tech Clinic, so make you get, sure you get your questions in for that, and John will answer them. Yeah, and now, before you go, remember to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com, where you can buy a very fetching pink t-shirt That's like right, this. limited edition t-shirts for one. the month of May. Ooh. This one is a brand spanker as well. Yeah, so, yeah, like very that. like that. And then, ha we featured this yesterday in the tech show, in the GCN show. This is... Nice bit of tech. Yeah, it's like um, uh, like a what are phone they called? Stand. Well, it's a phone stand, but also it's oh, you good can, for yeah. selfies. Oh yeah. Uh, be warned. No idea like that. Be warned if you buy one of these, you will spend your entire time fiddling with it absentmindedly because mm. it's incredibly satisfying. It's like one of those fidget spinners. That's the new fidget spinner. Yep. It's like done. suspension. Anyway, there we go. Yeah. I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> now, for another great video, how about clicking down here for Emma's geek edition of that bike fit video? I'm interested in that one, being a geek and all. Would you stop that? I told you, mate, you can't stop. It's like Pringles. <laughs> <laughs>